Since the last film report, General Nazaro and I have moved around the command a great deal. And we are pleased with the job being done. Anyone who had this opportunity would be impressed with the great diversity in SAC operations and the uniformly high professional level of the people performing these operations. Missile crews and supporting units, bomber and tanker crews and support people, all have the unmistakable mark of quality that has characterized the Strategic Air Command for 20 years. This quality generates confidence and credibility, two vital elements in both deterrence and combat operations. For example, SAC tanker and bomber units in the Pacific and Southeast Asia are earning respect for the Strategic Air Command from both our friends and enemies. There are new films of SAC's operations in that area in this report. Of particular interest in this report are films of two new combat aircraft we are looking forward to seeing in SOC. The SR-71 and the FB-111, both these aircraft have great potential, and we are extremely interested in their development and integration into the command. With more of the kind of performance demonstrated by SOC people last year, and with such challenging new weapon systems entering the command, I am convinced that SAC will continue to set new standards of professionalism and performance in accomplishing its mission. Kadena, Okinawa, main air base for the 42nd, 52nd Strategic Wing, whose around-the-clock mission is the in-flight refueling of PACAF tactical aircraft stationed in Southeast Asia, as well as the B-52s from Guam. By January 1966, there were some 1,100 PCS SAC ground support and operations personnel at Kadena. The tanker air crews had been flying both types of missions, refueling the fighter aircraft and the B-52s. The wing at Kadena maintains a complement of 55 KC-135s, 25 tankers in support of the fighter aircraft, 30 tankers to refuel the B-52s. The B-52 tankers are two stateside SAC units on 120-day rotation. The 25 tankers supporting fighter aircraft are drawn from 36 different SAC units in the United States. They rotate at the rate of three a week and then operate from Kadena and two bases in Thailand. This rotation provides valuable logistics support. Each tanker from the States brings in an average of 51 passengers and over 12,000 pounds of cargo. This greatly reduces the pressing workload of the Military Airlift Command and further assures prompt delivery of essential materiel. Requests for tanker support of fighter aircraft are coordinated by a SAC liaison officer with the 2nd Air Division, now the 7th Air Force, at Saigon. And the refueling operations are accomplished in two primary areas. One over the Gulf of Tonkin, the other over Thailand. Tankers from three bases service these areas, Kadena, Okinawa, Bangkok, Thailand, and Takli Air Base, Thailand. Tanker operations at Takli Air Base began in September 1965 with three KC-135s assigned. By January 1966, this number had increased to 10, and there were also four tankers flying out of Bangkok. Each day, tankers and crews rotate from Kadena to Takli and Bangkok for one week TDY. Some 150 SAC maintenance and operations personnel are stationed at Takli. They, like the SAC ground support people at Bangkok, are a detachment of the 42nd, 52nd wing and are PCS. A new ramp was constructed to facilitate parking the SAC tankers and the PACAF and MAC aircraft operating from the base. For the enormous amount of fuel required by the tankers, 
daily runs are made from Bangkok by scores of trucks that pump their fuel load into a tank farm. This air transportable farm can feed the KC-135s at the rate of 600 gallons a minute. These teakwood buildings, called huches, serve as barracks for the officers and airmen at Takli. Each one houses about 16 men. Construction is underway for new barracks. 100 miles south of Takli is Thailand's capital city, Bangkok. Here the SAC tanker crews and ground support people work at nearby Dan Muang Air Base. They are housed in the city. But there's little time for sightseeing in this war where SAC tankers must support Air Force strikes being conducted 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The tanker crews of the 42nd, 52nd wing average 14 missions a month. But when they are TDY to Thailand bases, they may fly seven missions a week. Since these are in direct support of combat missions and frequently occur in areas that are considered hostile, each crew member is awarded an air medal for the successful completion of 15 missions. The planned time for refueling a fighter aircraft is five minutes. But because of the proficiency and teamwork of the tanker crews and tactical pilots, this is normally accomplished in three minutes. At the time of this report, the wing at Kadena, together with its detachments in Thailand, were flying over 1,000 missions a month. In the fall of 1965, Tan Sanut Air Base, South Vietnam, saw arrival of one of the latest facilities for processing and exploiting strategic reconnaissance photography, a complete, self-sufficient, relocatable laboratory. This was the first overseas deployment of the facility, which can be readily moved by cargo aircraft, ship, truck, or railway flat car. The complete complex consists of 15 units, 13 basic shelters, that house photographic processing and interpretation equipment, and two electrical support units. Smaller combinations of units can be used where maximum laboratory capacity is not required. All units are constructed for worldwide outdoor operations. Called a strategic air relocatable photographic facility, the complex at Tansanut is under command of SAC's 544th Aerospace Reconnaissance Technical Wing Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. The shelters are air-conditioned and maintain a comfortable and dust-free working environment over a wide weather range. With their sophisticated equipment and skilled airmen technicians, the units provide photographic processing in forward areas equal in quality to that produced in fixed installations. Now, perhaps more than at any other time in our history, the strategic reconnaissance role is vital to military operations. It was a SAC reconnaissance aircraft that first detected the Soviet missiles in Cuba. And today, SAC reconnaissance is providing photographic coverage of Viet Cong installations, defenses, and lines of communication. SAC's new relocatable photographic facility stationed in Vietnam is providing rapid processing and dissemination of this and other strategic air photo information gathered over Southeast Asia. Information that is indispensable to our commanders and intelligence specialists in the Vietnamese War. The latest aircraft weapon system in the SAC inventory is the world's most advanced strategic reconnaissance plane, the SR-71. The aircraft, which crews at better than Mach 3, with a ceiling above 80,000 feet, have been assigned to the 4200th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing, Beale Air Force Base, California. The SR-71, with its wide variety of systems, will perform practically any type of observation mission, from simple battlefield surveillance through interdiction reconnaissance to strategic. Cruising at a speed faster than a rifle bullet and over 15 miles above the Earth it will be able to survey 60,000 square miles of land or ocean an hour. 
comparable in size to the b fifty eight the plane has a two man crew a pilot and a reconnaissance systems officer strategic reconnaissance as an indispensable role in strategic warfare planning the s r seventy one will provide this vital information in any weather at any hour anywhere in the world this is the f one eleven a bomber version of this aircraft to be called the f b one eleven is currently programmed for the strategic air command unique feature of the aircraft is its variable sweep wings whose angle can be changed in flight. The F-111, a tactical fighter that will be used by the Air Force and the Navy, is still undergoing environmental tests. Speaking of the F-B-111, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara said, quote, it will have twice the speed of the B-52 aircraft approximately, with approximately the same range. It will fly faster both at low altitude and high altitude, and it will have capabilities for penetrating enemy defenses far greater than the plane it replaces. It will come into operational use in 1968. All of the units authorized will be equipped and operational by 1971, unquote. Under present Department of Defense planning, there will be a force of some 210 FB-111s completed at the time of the retirement of the B-58 and many of the earlier models of the B-52. In October, at the Boeing Company's Wichita, Kansas division, a new package concept for loading B-52s was developed. Called Big Belly, the program had two objectives. Increase the B-52's conventional bomb-carrying capability and speed up bomb loading time. The initial tests were made using 500-pound bombs. These were preloaded on three A-frames. 28 bombs to the frame and towed to the aircraft, a B-52D whose bomb bay section had been strengthened to support special clip-in racks. Although the bombs were inert, all munition safety procedures were followed. Each package of 28 bombs was lifted into the bomb bay and clipped in place. Using this system for 500 pounders, the B-52 can carry 108 bombs. 84 internally, and 24 more on its wing racks. This is 27 tons of munitions, an increase of over 57% above the B-52's present carrying capacity for this same type of bomb. Meeting the program's second objective, the aircraft was fully loaded in less than one-third the time previously required. The program reached a milestone in November with the first drop of live ammunition over the Air Proving Ground Center, Eglin Air Force Base, Florida. Here, the system proved that its release sequence intervals would get the bombs out within the parameters dictated by SAC. Aircraft speed was 350 knots indicated. Bomb release altitude, 2,500 feet. The 108 bombs delivered on each run were Mark 82 500 pound low drag general purpose. Other types of heavy bombs, such as 750 and 1,000 pounders, have already been fit tested for this system. SAC, working with the Air Proving Ground Center and the Air Force Systems Command, is conducting follow on tests to prove the feasibility of the live drop of these other types. The Big Belly 500-pound bomb test at Eglin was highly successful. Current planning is to install the system in the entire B-52D fleet. The major modification is strengthening of the bomb bay section and in no way affects the aircraft's ability to carry nuclear weapons. Along with the heavier conventional bombs, this system will be tested for the drop of other non-nuclear munitions that offer a potential use by SAC against the communists in Vietnam. At Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, technicians of the 1st Strategic Aerospace Division 
Install instrumentation and destruct packages in a Titan II. This is part of the work in preparing missiles for operational test launching, a major part of SAC's continuing program to verify missile systems reliability and evaluate combat launch crews. Test launch ICBMs are selected at random from SAC's alert complement of Minuteman and Titan II missiles. All missiles removed for test launch are immediately replaced. After instrumentation, a combat crew selected from airmen on actual alert duty at the missile's home station take over. They install the bird, bring it to full alert, and stand by for the launch order. Titan II carries the largest of all ICBM payloads and has a reaction time of less than one minute. Throughout the flight, the telemetry systems aboard an operational test missile radio complete status reports. Should the missile stray from course, it can be instantly destroyed. SAC has 54 of these giants in its alert force. By the end of January, nine operational Titan IIs had been successfully test launched, further confirming the system's reliability and the confidence of its crews. At Chanute Air Force Base, Illinois, another missile activity. Airmen in training for their future roles as combat crews and maintenance specialists in SAC's Minuteman Force. Because of the systems changes developing from the Force Modernization Program, the Air Training Command's Missile School at Chanute has a dual mission. It trains new personnel and has special conversion courses so that present Minuteman 1 crews can quickly qualify on the Minuteman 2, the latest missile system entering the inventory. After a concentrated and intensive academic program, launch officer students put their knowledge to work using missile training consoles. In this realistic environment, they solve problems inserted from the instructor console and become familiar with operational procedures. Maintenance specialists and other support technicians taking the Minuteman II course use a full-scale launch facility mock-up for the practical application of their classroom teaching. Minuteman II, a 60-footer, is longer than Minuteman I and has greater range, payload, and accuracy than its predecessor. This vehicle is used to transport the Minuteman to remote launch facilities and install it directly in the silo. The students learn every phase of its maintenance and operation. Under the modernization program, all Minuteman I silos and control centers will be modified to accommodate Minuteman II. When the facilities are turned over by the contractor to SAC, qualified airmen will be ready to man the sites. Minuteman missiles are programmed for the Strategic Air Command. By the end of January 1966, 830 of these were already strategically deployed in fully hardened complexes in the central and western United States. Anderson Air Force Base, Guam, home station for the B-52s being launched almost daily in bombing attacks against Viet Cong targets in South Vietnam. Under SAC's contingency planning, thousands of tons of conventional ordnance had been pre-stocked at Anderson Air Force Base long before the first bombing raids, which began on June 18, 1965. By January 31, 1966, the stratofortresses flying from Anderson in dropping more than 109,000 heavy bombs and 3,000 canisters of Blue 3 bomblets had hit the Viet Cong with over 37,000 tons of munitions. Continuous planning and efficient materiel and logistics management has maintained the ordnance stockpile at required levels. 
Generally, the aircraft carry 750 or 500 pound bombs. On some strikes, where the penetration of extremely thick jungles or the collapse of enemy tunnels has been required, 1,000 pound semi-armor piercing bombs have been used. This preloaded Hayes dispenser contains another type of ordnance employed, the Blue 3 anti-materiel bomblet. The bomblets are packed in canisters, which are placed in the dispenser. In operation, the canisters are released from the dispenser and open at a preset altitude to permit free fall of the bomblets. The B-52 accommodates two Hayes dispensers. These can be installed in about 30 minutes. When so loaded, the aircraft is carrying 10,656 anti-materiel bomblets. At Anderson, as at all SAC bases, the task of keeping their skills at battle efficiency never ends, as maintenance and support people continuously prove their ability to keep their aircraft combat ready. All B-52 strike requests are issued by the military assistance commander in South Vietnam and directed to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Informational copies go to Headquarters SAC, PACAF, and the 3rd Air Division at Anderson Air Force Base, Guam. While no mission goes without an order from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the 3rd Air Division immediately begins planning for the requested strike. This greatly reduces reaction time when JCS approval is received. Coordinating with SAC headquarters, detailed sortie folders are prepared, briefings are held, and the specific type of ordnance to be carried by each aircraft is loaded. Reaction time from the receipt of a normal request until the planes are over their objective is 24 hours, and this includes the six hours flying time to target. In urgent situations, such as close air support for our ground forces, the B-52s have blasted the enemy just 15 hours after the request was received. Along with their present job of striking targets in South Vietnam, the 30 bombers at Guam are on call for strikes on strategic targets as directed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In the first seven months since the B-52 raids began, Four SAC bomber wings have been in the action. The 7th from Carswell Air Force Base, Texas. The 454th, Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. The 320th, Mather Air Force Base, California. And the 2nd, Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana. During the period of this report, air crews at Guam were on 120 days rotation. The average crew flew seven missions a month for some 84 hours flying time. The air crews get hostile fire pay for each month in which they fly at least one mission. set off on their sorties, the crews spot what they call the Skunk, a Soviet ship that keeps watch just three miles off the island. This trawler is equipped with high-powered radar and other electronic instrumentation. B-52s would rendezvous with KC-135 tankers from Kadena Air Base, Okinawa, that had been holding on station for 15 minutes, waiting to refuel the bomber force. During November 1965, a new procedure was developed for this operation, on-course rendezvous using buddy refueling tactics. With this technique, the bombers and the tankers fly in trail from their bases heading for a predetermined on-course refueling entry point. The maneuver is so precisely executed that each tanker reaches the entry point and turns onto the refueling course just one minute ahead of the bomber it will refuel, 
offloading more than 80,000 pounds of fuel. The on-course procedure permits rapid air-to-air -air refueling of a large number of bombers in a limited airspace without varying their course to target. And since the aircraft are refueling in trail and at varied altitudes, it is a safer operation. At the end of the refueling run, the bombers continue toward their target IP. The majority of the tankers return to Kadena, but some recover at Clark Air Base in the Philippines as emergency standbys for bombers that might need fuel on their return from the strike. All bombing is by radar offset, in which the radar returns from hills, bridges, rivers, and other such features, whose exact locations are known, are used to pinpoint the target area. To obtain as many of these offset points as possible, SAC conducted radar reconnaissance over the entire country of South Vietnam. 40 seconds. Coming up on 30 seconds. Check circuit breaker radar. Yeah. Then you go back to the right radar. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. You want it? Yeah, well, I can take it. Circuit breakers are ready. 30 seconds. You got a wander in FCI drive. Sure. That's it. Six seconds to go. You're centered. One left. Taking it. Yeah, the other half down, brother. Good. A B-52 with Hayes dispensers releases its canisters on a run that delivers over 10,000 bomblets on a Viet Cong position. By January 31, 1966, B-52s had rained bombs on VC targets from one end of South Vietnam to the other. 163 missions had been flown, representing 2,949 individual sorties. Many of these were close air support for our ground forces. When B-52s made their first strikes in direct support of the United States Marines, Major General L.W. Walt, commander of the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force in Vietnam, sent two messages to General John D. Ryan, SAC Commander-in-Chief. In the first, the Marine General wrote, We are more than impressed with the results. We are delighted. The timing was precise, the bombing accurate, and the overall effect awesome to behold. We are now going down into the valley to take a closer look. His second message stated, we are now down in the valley and seeing at first hand the tremendous shock effect caused by the bombing. The enemy has abandoned his prepared positions and much of his equipment in great confusion. And this is making our part of the job easier. Many thanks for your wonderful support. Air medals for the successful completion of 15 combat missions are presented by Major General William J. Crum. 3rd Air Division Commander, Anderson Air Force Base, to members of the 7th Bomb Wing. During a recent visit to Guam, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara commended the SAC crews and ground support personnel for their professionalism and then noted, no longer can the communist forces in Vietnam feel secure in their formerly unpenetrable jungle bases.
they know they are subject to intensive bombing attacks at any place at any time of the day or night these attacks have had and will continue to have a considerable effect on the war in vietnam